All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, sorry about this awkward format here for today's class. Uh, obviously, I would prefer to just do this lecture in person, but since there were kind of some kind of extenuating circumstances, I do need to have today's lecture in this format. Uh, so I encourage you, if you have any questions about some of this stuff, or if I'm just not explaining something clearly, uh, please let me know, and I'd be happy to try to help you with this. But hopefully through this format, we can still go through some of the critical stuff that I wanted to cover today through this slide presentation. Uh, again, though, if anything comes up, let me know. So let's get started. All right, so today's goal is to kind of continue on with what we were talking about in our previous class. Obviously, in our last lecture, we introduced ourselves to what clinical psychology was all about. We discussed some of the, the different figures that were big and then also spent a lot of time talking about the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is really pivotal uh, in terms of being a tool for clinicians to kind of speak common language with each other. But once we get past speaking a common language with each other, then there's still a lot of perspectives in clinical psychology as to how people are best treated, how we can help individuals with a whole variety of different issues. And to kind of understand how we got to where we are now, what I thought we'd do is first take a journey into our past and, and look at some of the ways that clinicians or, or theorists have kind of proposed where clinical problems are coming from and, and through that, kind of see how they tried to tackle some of the major issues that people were struggling with, not only just a couple decades ago, but a couple centuries ago. So if we go back into our, our, our past history, even past you know our current version of science into the 14, 1500s or, or even beyond, what we see is that mental abnormalities were not necessarily commonplace, but existent way back then as well. And back then, a lot of beliefs as to where these were coming from circulated around this notion that maybe people were struggling with mental problems, whatever form they're in, because of some type of spiritual or existential thing that needed to be fixed. And this led to a lot of unusual techniques to try to help people with a variety of different problems. Uh, a process called trepanation, which you can look for in books or online where they actually would cut open the skull of individuals to theoretically let out demons or try to kind of balance out the humors of a person. What well, was not necessarily a common approach to kind of helping people with problems, but a practice approach that, that a number of different societies tried out over the different generations. Uh, exorcisms in lots of European countries were, were not necessarily, again, commonplace, but used to try to pe treat people with extreme behavioral or emotional issues. And, and there were lots of rituals that were developed over the years in different cultures to try to kind of attack the idea of psychological abnormalities being linked to, again, something spiritual in nature. And this was commonplace until about the 16 and 1700s when we, we started to shift our perception on where different problems were coming from. And, and one of the big theories that started to pop up that, that kind of explained maybe an alternative to where problems were coming from was this idea of something called the somatogenic hypothesis. And, and, and it seemed like an intuitive thing at the time. There was this notion that maybe when we were looking at people with problems, we were looking at individuals who had some type of shift in their body, some type of shift in their chemistry that, that was causing them to display these abnormal thoughts or behaviors or, or just have problems adjusting to society. This sort of makes intuitive sense. And then in fact, today we still have some residual ideas that, that kind of focus on this being linked to lots of different disorders. But the conclusion they came to after this hypothesis was proposed became problematic. So lots of societies, once they started to propose this magic, uh, so somatogenic idea, started to suggest that these shifts in the brain, these changes in biology were actually unfixable. And this led to the development of a lot of what was then called hospitals, which is really just kind of prisons for individuals with different mental problems or, or individuals that they also just wanted to kind of get out of society. Uh, beggars became commonplace uh, participants in these hospitals again that they had. And and, and doing this, they, they, they kind of rested their laurels on this notion that once something's wrong, when something's broken, there really is no fixing it. So it's just more about managing the individual and the problem that they're struggling with. 
this was a persistent idea actually for over a century until some major researchers as the, the kind of medical movement started to kind of pick up and we started to understand it a little bit better started to, to push back on this notion if we're looking for the champion of this idea we, we can actually link a lot of structural changes and philosophical changes in our belief of this semantogenic hypothesis to a gentleman who was actually in charge of the parisian hospital system uh, obviously in france uh, a gentleman named philippe Penel, who in 1793 when he became the head of the parisian hospital system decided to try to completely revamp their systems uh, he focused on rehabilitation he focused on this notion uh, that, that the these individuals were not actually spreading diseases that they were curable and and this led to a complete revamping of how these hospitals is what they called them uh, actually operated so these people were no longer kind of chained up in prison cells essentially for their entire life treated as individuals to kind of look at and, and kind of joke about and instead they were treated as people that were in serious need of help and, and this issued in a new era uh, of maintenance and it also eventually led to kind of a door being open for Sigmund Freud when he started to push his psychodynamic theory about a century later uh, people had already kind of grappled with this notion that that you could help people and interact with people with mental disorders and not catch them so when freud started to say that maybe these problems weren't just coming from biology but instead an interplay between psychology and the world we were around and and, and other things that were going on outside of us it, it didn't kind of get met with dead ears people started to, to kind of recognize that there was some logic to his uh, approach and then eventually led us to introduce some new models of disorders and, and clinical issues and, and also some new approaches to treatment so one of the, the major terms started to pop up and is still circulated a lot today when talking about clinical issues is something called the biopsychosocial model of, of stress and it, it, sorry of disorders and what it suggests is that when people are displaying symptoms linked to something like depression or anxiety disorders like generalized anxiety disorder or a whole slew of other problems that we're going to be discussing in the later portion of this class the, the idea is here that these things aren't coming from one thing like our biology or genes or something shifting within us but usually a byproduct of, of our changes in our body that are coinciding with psychological factors that we're going through maybe the stresses that we have or the beliefs that we've developed and also the social factors that we're encountering you know more stress in school fights with your family other kind of environmental problems could really exacerbate the biological components or psychological components that could lead to somebody having Having a disorder and it also led to this new perspective that if we're going to try to help somebody we probably need to do it by treating all of these different components so looking at the biology of a person's big but we also have to look at the social environment that somebody's in and the psychological factors that they're going through if we really want to tackle the, the big problems that these people are struggling with it also led to a very related theory called the diathesis stress model that suggested that if we want to know where somebody's problems coming from or, or the propensity for somebody to develop a specific problem we have to take into consideration both their biological predispositions which could be their genetic components or things that are changing within their body and the the environment that they're finding themselves in currently the amount of stress they're experiencing could push us to a point where we have a disorder and it suggested something kind of neat at the time it suggested that all of us have a proclivity to develop some type of disorder if the right environmental cues happen in combination with what our bodies kind of giving us an inclination for in the first place it suggested that you know there's some people where they could withstand a lot of stress and have a lot of problems going on in their life and still not display any mental issues well, others if they've got the right genetic proclivity or again maybe they've experienced something that shifted their body might be very close to, to having mental issues if, if just a small amount of stress kind of pushed them in that direction it kind of treated us like a sliding scale with this notion that you know if certain things happened they could be enough in combination to, to cause a whole combination of, of different problems that people were struggling with and when we started talking about this model when we started looking at the biopsychosocial model as alternatives to some of the original ideas like the semantic hypothesis it really opened the door for a lot of people to explore how we could tackle clinical problems that people were having in completely different ways
if we're looking at one of the shifts that started to kind of coincide with this change in the models, it was this notion that maybe if biology is one of the things that's causing the abnormalities, even if it's not the source of the problems, uh, one of the ways to fix these problems is through changing a person's biology. Uh, psychosurgery was something that was done centuries ago. Uh, you know, trepanation, I guess, technically could be considered a type of psychosurgery, but even after trepanation was kind of dispelled and, and we started looking at other ways, people recognized that shifting the brain could shift the person. So things like lobotomies and other approaches were, were done for centuries and became kind of uh, talked about option when people were struggling with extreme problems, even to the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, nowadays, psychosurgeries aren't used that often, but it was an approach that, that was considered something that was nestled in science, that the idea that if a problem was a result of a shift in the brain, we just had to shift the brain back and everything could be fine. Uh, another thing that was closely linked to this was this idea of something called electroconvulsive shock therapy, where you could start set large charges through a person's brain and, and through it cause their brain to kind of rewire itself, to, to, to kind of recalibrate itself in a way that allows the person to function at a normal level. I, I think both of these techniques persisted for a long period of time because there were some pretty pronounced effects that happen when people went through ECT or some type of lobotomy. And, and sometimes some of the symptoms that they were trying to treat were probably treated through these approaches. Now, it usually probably led to people having big other issues that they were struggling with. You know, lots of people not capable of comprehending a lot of stuff or functioning at a very high level. But, you know, if you're trying to control somebody's angry or outbursts through ECT, it, you can dull them pretty quickly by resetting their brain, even if it shifts them entirely for the rest of their life. So, so I think there was probably some logic to why psychosurgery persisted for so long, but ECT, uh, obviously different types of lobotomies are, are not used really in today's age. I, I know there's some random stories that will pop, sometimes pop up about how ECT might be used for extreme depression or other things that we just can't find a treatment for and there, there's some validity to their use, but those are few and far between. Usually when we're talking about the big shift to trying to treat people through biology with the new theories that started to pop up in the 1900s, we're talking about people focusing their approaches towards medications that can fix us on the cellular level. And there's a whole slew of different medications that can try to help with a bunch of different problems through attacking things on the cellular level. But if we're looking at how these things work in terms of psychological problems, usually we're looking at things that are adjusting our neurochemicals. So that the neurotransmitters that our neurons use to communicate with each other are either made more plentiful or more effective through some type of introduction of a drug. Now, obviously, it's been a long time since we talked about drugs in the brain, so if you need some review on that, <coughs> sorry, oh, sorry for coughing into the microphone, uh, feel free to review that stuff. But know that this is one of the more commonplace approaches that's out there nowadays to try to help people with a litany of problems that they're struggling with. And <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, for good reason, this is actually used. I, what we see with a lot of medications is that they can help very quickly and, and across a whole range of different problems that people are struggling with. And, and the quick acting effects and, and the fact that they are very multifaceted and, and can be used in different combinations to help with a whole slew of different problems has caused a lot of clinicians and a lot of hospitals so to, to kind of lean heavily on these things in, in order to try to treat people with different problems over the last especially couple decades. But there are a lot of clinicians that are pushing back to, on this idea. Uh, there's a lot of people that have started to note the fact that we've got a huge percentage of the population, especially in our westernized societies, that are on some type of medication for different problems that they're struggling with. And this can lead to just this overabundance and overcirculation of drugs that, that maybe don't need to be taken for a long period of time, but it can also lead to people thinking either psychologically that they need these drugs or physically feeling like they need these drugs to be able to function at a normal level, even if when they were originally taking the drugs, 
<clears throat> their their symptoms were relatively small. Uh, and, and this also is something that's paired with what we call tolerance effects, where the more you take a drug, oftentimes the more you need higher doses of it for it to have the same effects. Many psychoactive drugs that, that we're taking for clinical purposes don't have really bad tolerance effects, but there are some out there where you need to continue upping the strength of the drug that you're taking to get the same effects over the long run. And this also brings us to another issue, and that's the fact that when people get on a lot of these drugs, even though there's this notion that it might just be temporary so they can kind of clear things up and get their life back in order and then they can stop taking the drug, there's a lot of people that when they start taking these drugs don't really have an end in sight. There's this notion that they can take this drug pretty much for the rest of their lives. And, and hope to kind of continue experiencing the effects w without any plan as to what can they can do to, to kind of get themselves off the drugs over the long run. And there has been a big shift in the community over the last decade or two to try to prevent this from happening, to get people eventually weaned off of drugs and, and kind of fixed through other things. But you know, when medication started to be circulated, there was really no long-term plan with a lot of them. It was just, hey, it fixes this problem. So let's fix it and then figure things out later on. And, and this is something that a lot of clinicians have said is, is the inherent issue with this. You know, these drugs are maybe removing symptoms, but maybe they're not fixing things. My favorite analogy to this is if you say you have a car that's not working very well, maybe it's dripping oil all over the place. Well, if you take that car into a mechanic and the mechanic says, well, you don't have any oil, we need to quickly put oil in your car and make sure that it's functioning fine so I can go fix the problem. You'd think that mechanic's probably a, a very sound person. He's, he or she is probably giving you good advice and, and you're going to go with that advice, put some oil in the car and then try to fix it. But if the mechanic says, whoa, you're dripping oil, well, let's put oil in it. And then every 10 or 15 miles, just pull over to the side, put some more oil in it, you know, 10, 15 miles, put more oil in it you probably think that he or she is not making very good sense at that point. And that's kind of what people have considered drugs to be like. You know, if you're taking a drug to kind of help with the symptoms, you're not necessarily getting at the root of the problem. It's not that you don't want drugs as an option, but using them as the sole approach to trying to treat something is considered a problem by a lot of clinicians. And it's if we're looking at it, the, the main biological approach that's out there. But, but there are other biological approaches that are probably worth mentioning if we're looking at current trends. Uh, one of the things that started to pick up a lot of steam in terms of its popularity, but also its controversy, is, is something that we call the genetic counseling approach, where we can actually start to link specific disorders or, or specific issues, sometimes you know ones that are linked to clinical problems, other times maybe linked to aging issues, um, to a person's genetics. Uh, so we can look for genetic code that's kind of a precursor to the development of something like early onset Alzheimer's or a, a proclivity for substance abuse. And we can use this theoretically if we're looking at just an adult's genes to make them aware of what could potentially happen. You know, we can say to a 15 year old, look, we just did a genetic test and it looks like you might have an issue with substance abuse. So maybe you wanna be a little bit leery of going out and drinking with your friends when you're 15, 16, because that's usually a quick path for somebody with your genes to, to go down that route of developing substance abuse. Or maybe you tell somebody who's in their 30s, look, you've got the genetic combination for early onset Alzheimer's, so there's a good chance you're gonna start losing your memory and your ability to understand things within the next decade or so. You wanna make the most of your life now, there's just a thought that that might be beneficial to some individuals. Now, some people don't want to know these things, even if we do have information on it, uh, but others maybe feel like that's a good thing to know in advance. This is one aspect of the genetic counseling debate, but what this quickly turns into is, well, if I know about this for me, I maybe want to know this for my offspring as well. I, I want to know what are the chances of my son or daughter developing this specific problem? Or, or, or what are the chances of somebody I know developing this specific problem? Uh, and, and this leads to the question of things like ending the life of a, an embryo if it's got a specific genetic combination or even creating what's sometimes called designer babies. And it, and it puts us down a slippery slope that, that's hotly debated, which is why even though on the surface it seems like a logical intuitive thing, you know, looking at somebody's genetics so we can know if they have a predisposition predisposition for something, 
it, it can lead us into some murkier areas, and that's why people have kind of steered away from it uh, over the years as kind of an option, but something that we have to approach with a lot of caution. Of course, when we're looking at treating specific problems, though, we have to remember we're in a psychology class, so we don't want to spend too much time talking about drugs, and instead, we want to focus a little bit more of our attention on this approach that we call psychotherapy. And, and this is the approach that really started to pick up as Freud and other clinicians started to argue that a lot of our problems are coming from our psychology and, and the environment that we find ourselves in. Psychotherapy comes in a lot of different forms, but their goal is always the same, to try to adjust the person's problems or kind of try to get at issues by looking at what's going on in the person's head. And the theory is if we can get at what's going on in your head that needs to, to kind of be recalibrated, we can help you with a lot of the problems that you have. But how we get into the head, how we kind of recalibrate things is, is varied widely from approach to approach. It's been developed over the years. If we're looking at the classic approach to psychotherapy, it's still probably to this day psychoanalysis. It's certainly not a highly celebrated approach to clinical psychology, but if you watch any movie or show or hear anybody talking about their persistent problems, usually there's nuances of psychoanalysis still hidden in, in what they're discussing. You know, we were exploring in psychoanalysis our childhood, our, our hidden desires, our, our kind of unconscious that, that Freud talked about, and we're doing it through a bunch of different means. So sometimes it does involve us just sitting on a couch and talking about our childhood. Other times it could involve us trying to break down the dreams that we had, or if we've got a therapist that's very interested in psychoanalysis, it could involve hypnotism or, or some type of free association approach, which helps the, the therapist and the person kind of dive into their unconscious and the problems that they're struggling with. Historically, this was kind of the first stab at trying to understand how we could help people through addressing the mind and you know, trying to kind of get at the problems that they were struggling with. Over time, this started to give way to other approaches, even though it still persists again today and is still reflected in a lot of the, the clinical approaches that people have, even if they don't link themselves up to Sigmund Freud. If we're looking at an approach that's kind of a big pushback to Freud, something that was proposed as an alternative to the Freudian perspective, we can actually go back to that behavioral view that we talked about a number of classes ago, where people were looking at the concepts of learning and association and how we kind of acquire behaviors. And, and what we can do is, is kind of see that many behaviors in the 1920s, 1930s thought, well, this might not only explain our day-to-day -day behaviors, but maybe we could use the processes of operant conditioning and classical conditioning and learning to try to help people that have developed abnormal behaviors, assuming that they're coming from those learning experiences. And, and in some areas, this particular approach works really well. Uh, we, we know it works somewhat well with drug abuse treatment. Uh, it's, it's kind of one of the few things that seems to have validity to it. Uh, things like antabuse and other chemicals that, that kind of cause people to get sick when they drink alcohol um, is, is something that they can a sort of curve alcohol or substance abuse issues. Uh, it's also okay with eating disorders, uh, but if we're looking for one of the places where behaviorism has proved to be really effective, it's actually the development of something we're gonna talk about in our next class called phobias, where, where people show strong, averse fears to things that, that really impact their day-to-day -day functioning. And in fact, to see how effective this can be and, and how this behavioral approach can apply and also how we can kind of describe it through cognitive terms, I've uploaded onto the class site a video called the behavioral treatment for phobias. And then you'll see a woman who's got a really strong fear of snakes uh, exposed through something we call brief therapy to the snake. And, and through kind of the gradual exposure to the snake, she overcomes a lot of her fears. And, and by the end of the session, she's even touching and holding the snake, which is really profound if you think about it. Because in the beginning, she's describing snakes and not able to even talk because it's just so terrifying to her. Uh, we're going to qualify exactly what makes a phobia a phobia in our next class, but I encourage you to, to go check out that video today that shows her getting that treatment because it really highlights one of the places where behavioral therapy has proven to be very effective. There's other places where it works, but that's definitely one of the places where it, it seems to be working really, really well. And, and this is what 
we'll see with a lot of the other approaches that we're going to talk about. They have certain spots where they're good and others where they're not so hot. Another approach that's picked up a lot over the last couple of decades stems from the, the social cognitive approach to, to kind of understanding personality that we talked about earlier and, and also the growth of cognitive and social psychology as a whole. It's something that we call the cognitive behavioral approach to therapy. Uh, here, what clinicians are doing is not necessarily just using behavioral mechanisms to help an individual, but, but trying to kind of address the cognitive aspects to the, the, the problems that somebody might be struggling with. And so here, you're, you're looking at learning, you're looking at kind of how people associate things, but, but you're trying to help somebody not just through simple behavioral approaches, but, but kind of addressing a person's thoughts, recognizing the emotions that are related to, to their problems, and through that, trying to help them. Now, when we're looking at CBT, it's really important to stress that there are a lot of different CBT approaches that are out there. Some focus on kind of grand overarching schemes that people might have about themselves in the world and trying to adjust those. Others focus on kind of reactions to the moment that, that somebody's struggling with. Uh, a, a classic example of this is actually something that's listed here on this slide called rational emotive behavioral therapy, where the, the clinicians who's using this try to address the, the, the specific reactions to an instance so they can break down, okay, what thought process were you going through? How can we change this irrational thought or this irrational belief to, to kind of make the situation work better for you? Uh, and there's other ones that kind of use a combination of these things. But whatever the, the kind of combination is, most techniques that are put on this pillar of CBT work pretty darn well. Uh, and in fact, that's why many people nowadays tend to refer to CBT as the gold standard for clinical treatment. It doesn't mean that you have to use CBT to help individuals, but if we're going to test the efficacy of a new treatment, maybe a new type of psychoanalysis or a new drug, what we tend to do is not just compare to people that are taking a placebo or, or control groups, but instead we compare this to individuals that are receiving CBT. And, and that this new technique is pretty effective for say depression or generalized anxiety disorder or substance abuse, things that we're gonna be talking about in the future, then we wanna see that this new technique's more effective than CBT. It, it really speaks to how effective this is across a wide range of different problems that people are struggling with. And, and again, it's, it's one of the, the, the more commonplace things that's out there since we've started to really develop our ideas of how to try to help people with a whole litany of different problems. Another alternative to some of the approaches that we've talked about so far, and one that's kind of celebrated a little bit more here in the Bay Area than other places, uh, actually relates to the work of Carl Rogers and, and his humanistic theory. Uh, obviously, when we talked about humanistic psychology in the past, we linked it to personality, talking about these different selves and trying to reach self-actualization and us constantly being on this quest to be better than we currently are. Well, the humanistic approach can also be applied to clinical psychology. Rogers and, and people that followed him actually proposed that if people are struggling with abnormal issues, maybe it's not their childhood that's a problem. Maybe it's mismatches of selves, or, or maybe it's not getting to achieve self-actualization, but it's kind of a root of the problems that people are struggling with. And to, to kind of help people, Rogers encouraged clinicians to try to treat individuals not as patients, but as clients. And, and he kind of pushed this approach that, that he eventually called client-centered therapy that, that allowed people to kind of explore what they thought was important, what they thought could help them, to, to try to kind of give them a, a means of, of, I guess, relief from whatever problems they were struggling with. And, and client-centered therapy had some very specific characteristics to it. Uh, you were supposed to, to kind of prevent, present this uh, unconditional positive regard for the, the, the what they called clients, not patients. Uh, so you, you were constantly kind of showing them that you cared about them, that maybe you didn't necessarily agree with some of the decisions they made, but you always had their back, you always supported them. You were supposed to always be smiling, making eye contact, kind of affirming what they were saying. Uh, and oftentimes you were engaging in these things called mirroring, where whatever they would say, you would just kind of shoot back to them. And the big thing that made this very different from all the other approaches was that the therapist was never supposed to lead where the conversation was going or, or what to address. They weren't supposed to say, let's focus on that or let's go here. They were just supposed to let the client kind of explore things on their own. 
And just to see how this works, I wanted to provide you with some links. So if you try to type in these links, it might be tough to do, uh, or you can look for Carl Rogers and Gloria and Albert Ellis and Gloria, but what you'll see with these two links are actually two videos of Carl Rogers is the first one, and, and Albert Ellis, a, a very popular social cognitive therapist that actually introduced rational emotive therapy. Uh, you're going to see those two individuals in these films interviewing a, kind of a famous person in our history, a woman named Gloria. Uh, Gloria actually was famous not because of anything she did in her career, but because she was willing to be filmed in some of the, the first filmed clinical sessions out there. So what you're going to see in that first video that's linked up there is Rogers interviewing Gloria and trying out this humanistic approach, this client-centered therapy. He's going to be smiling. He's going to be looking in at her. He's not going to be really directing the conversation. He's going to let her just say what she wants to say and let her lead the conversation where she wants it to lead. And then you'll go down to the bottom and you'll watch an Ellis video where he's talking about a pretty similar topic with Gloria, but their conversation is very different. So he's challenging her a lot. He's getting her to break down the thoughts that are going on inside of her head, the experiences, and, and he's trying to get her to kind of rethink what it is she's going through. And, and, and for those of you that like closure on things, know that Gloria, when she was interviewed by these two, argued that she loved Rogers. She actually, I think, <coughs> if I recall correctly, um, formed a relationship with him, not a, a bad relationship, but, but kind of a friendship with him over the years um, and, and talked about how she really liked the way he tried to help her, but she also admitted that maybe Ellis's approach would be better for her over the long run. Um, there were some other approaches that she also encountered that don't really fit in the grand scheme of things today, but I, I did want you to kind of get a chance to see some videos that, that really highlight how these two approaches work, because this really contrasts two of the more popular approaches that are out there. Some of you might find when you look at this video is that one might work pretty well for you. You know, some people love the idea of CBT and it just makes sense with them and maybe they want to get into that practice or maybe if they do have problems, they want to see somebody who's trained in CBT. Others might find humanistic approaches work for them. You know, maybe they, they, they're individuals that just feel like that, that need for comfort, that need for somebody that's kind of welcoming is, is a key element to, to kind of getting help and, and both do work but it does depend on kind of on the person and again if we're looking for the one that's considered a gold standard it's still cbt but it doesn't mean that humanistic psychology doesn't have value it's also probably important to note when we're talking about different disorders that are out there that we have had some recent trends over the last few decades really that are more a byproduct of societal changes than theoretical changes to what could possibly be causing problems that are pe that people are struggling with. If we're looking at one of the more commonplace approaches to therapy out there nowadays that, that, that's actually utilized a lot in clinics and, and especially in hospitals, there's an approach that's nowadays called brief therapy that, that's really worth talking about. Uh, brief therapy involves much less time with the therapist and we can call them patient or client uh, and, and much fewer meetings between the therapist and or client or and patient or client. Uh, instead, it's usually like 10 or 15 minute meetings that maybe will happen once a month or, or every other week if somebody's got really persistent problems. And, and these meetings don't really involve exploring a lot during the meetings, but really kind of getting a rundown of how things have worked over the last couple of weeks and then setting a game plan up for what could be done in the future weeks, what, what could be kind of addressed uh, over the, the course of whatever was going on in the, the next week or couple of weeks that the person wasn't going to be seeing a therapist. Now, this approach has really been, again, not a, a byproduct of a shift in philosophy, but a byproduct in the shift in kind of how our, our therapy and, and how people's mental health is, is taken care of. So many people nowadays get their mental health help through insurance companies or, or through hospitals. And both insurance companies and hospitals kind of function best or, or make the most money through seeing large numbers of people in a short period of time. So a lot of people who have insurance will be pushed by their insurance companies to engage in brief therapy. 
instead of kind of a one-on-one -on -one hour long session, which could cost upwards of two, $300, depending upon the therapist that somebody's seeing. Uh, it's not only valuable to insurance companies, but clinicians like it as well. Because if you can see one person for a hundred dollars, you know, for 15 minutes, that means you can see four people within an hour for $400 versus seeing one person for two or $300. The numbers I know sound astronomical, but there's other things that are in play that, that kind of make this a little less perfect. But, but, you know, bottom line is it's more profitable for insurance companies and hospitals to see people through brief therapy. People are kind of forced into seeing therapists through brief therapy. And because of it, it's just become extremely popular. Now, there's lots of research to suggest that the efficacy of brief therapy is not nearly as good as one-on-one -on -one sessions, but it doesn't mean that it's useless. Uh, and in fact, when used in conjunction with some of the medication approaches, it can really help a lot of people. So it's not that hospitals or, or, or other companies are, are being callous when they try to push brief therapy on individuals. It's, it's just kind of a matter of bottom line and trying to help a lot of people in a short period of time that's really making this be the new it thing for therapy. Uh, an alternative to this that a lot of hospitals and insurance companies really push on people is something called group therapy, where instead of people seeing a clinician one-on-one -on -one is happening, instead you've got a bunch of people seeing a clinician and, and these people tend to have similar problems that they're going through. Uh, group therapy, provides kind of the same benefits that we saw with brief therapy where you can get lots of people seeing a doctor within a short period of time so they're not paying as much but as an aggregate they're paying much more than what would be paid for a one-on-one -on -one meeting uh, but but you know it's dispersed so for clinicians they make more money in the same amount of time for insurance companies they pay less per client for these sessions so it's, it's kind of saves them money and and you know with just a numbers game it, it sort of is again the de facto thing that a lot of people are leaning on again in terms of efficacy there's some research to support that it's it's definitely better than nothing uh, group therapy for some people really works because you get to kind of bounce your ideas off of others hear about the struggles that other people are having um, but, but for some people, it doesn't work. It's kind of a, an individualized thing, much like lots of therapy is, but, but it's definitely one of the trends that we want to talk about if we're looking at new things that people are doing in clinical psychology. Another thing that's not necessarily new anymore, but kind of being revisited over the last couple of years is self-help groups. Now, you're going to talk about self-help groups when you discuss substance abuse. Uh, and I think you're going to be spending a decent amount of time talking about AA and, and kind of the history of it and the controversy over it. I know that when groups like AA were introduced and other self-help groups kind of came from that, they were celebrated as a really cool alternative to group therapy or one-on-one -on -one sessions because it was oftentimes free. I, you could, with self-help groups, just get together with a whole bunch of people struggling with problems and through some type of tenets or, or kind of written ideas as to how to pro uh, attack these problems, try to attack it as a group of individuals struggling with problems. Now, AA is unique in the sense that it's got sponsors and all of these other kind of spiritual things that are components to it that certainly doesn't have to be a part of self-help groups. And in fact, many self-help groups don't have those components to it. Um, but but it's very similar to group therapy in that you've got a bunch of people struggling with a problem that are coming together to help themselves. It's just different in that the clinician's not there. And, and because of it, it makes it a heck of a lot cheaper even if you make contributions to the groups, which some self-help groups do require people to do. And, and because it's cheaper, it's more flexible, self-help groups have really picked up in popularity. Uh, again, there are some people that have pushed back on this a lot. I, I know that you're going to be going over some stuff that suggested that self-help groups are not nearly as effective as people had touted them to be for a long period of time. Um, but, but know that this is, again, one of those alternatives that's picked up as a result of the society that we find ourselves in. Not a change in philosophy, but just a result of, of where we're at when we're looking at how to try to help people. Uh, and, and if we're looking at one approach that kind of doesn't fit the mold of the other ones is the last approach that I really want to talk about today, and it's something called eclectic therapy. Well, actually, nowadays, it's, it's called integrative psychotherapy. Eclectic therapy is, by some individuals, kind of considered a little bit of a slight of this approach. Uh, I think it gives the impression that you're just 
kind of randomly going after a problem by throwing everything you can at it. Uh, but if we're looking at what integrative psychotherapy is about nowadays, it's about trying to, to kind of incorporate a whole bunch of different philosophical approaches into treating an individual with a specific problem. So it means that to become an integrative psychotherapist, you need to be familiar with psychoanalysis. You, you need to be familiar with CBT. You need to be familiar with a humanistic approach and, and a whole bunch of specialized approaches that we don't have time in a class like this to talk about. So when you're meeting somebody, you can figure out what combination of things are, are best to kind of help that person tackle their problem. You know, is it a combination of drugs and day-to-day -day cognitive behavioral therapy? Is, is it a, a combination of the humanistic approach and changing the person's environment? You know, what, what's best to help the person is what integrative psychotherapists ask. Now, I, again, this is a newish approach that's maybe not changing our philosophy about where problems are coming from, but it's adjusting to our recognition of reality, where there's usually a combination of things that can help better than just one single thing when somebody's struggling with a different problem. And, and there's also this idea that, you know, each person's relatively unique and the problems they're struggling with can vary. So our approaches to tackle those problems should vary as well. Uh, again, eclectic therapy is not some term that you're going to hear a lot. People will use the term integrative psychotherapy because many people who started doing this did kind of just throw everything at people and saw what stick. But but if you're doing this from a very planned perspective, you know you can actually really come up with a good combination of things if you're trained appropriately to try to help people based on kind of your experience and your knowledge on the topics. And again, this is where I love to close out because it really highlights how we've developed since we first introduced kind of cures to different psychological ailments over the years. I mean, historically, yes, we can talk about trepanation, but even about 100, 120 years ago, our beliefs on how we could help people is greatly different from what we see nowadays when trying to treat individuals. And now that we've talked about treating people, what we're going to be doing when we come back on Wednesday is focusing our attention on what needs to be treated. So please, again, make sure that you watch those videos. I know we're going to go a little bit over 50 minutes, but you know, this format sucks. I can't do much about it. Um, but on Wednesday, I'll be back and we will start going over specific disorders. Uh, I encourage you to keep doing the readings, making sure you're up to date on that. But uh, for today, we're done with the lecture. Go watch those videos and I'll see you soon. Take care.